recently worked on the Peter Pan Live, doing rewrites on uh, the uh, Peter Pan for NBC, and she created new lyrics for On the 20th Century, which is currently running on Broadway. Did I leave anything out? Probably. Many things. Yes. Um, Amanda Green. Thank you. Stephen Schwartz, you've all heard many times in the last, today even, earlier, and you will hear more about him tonight. I will just list off a few things. Uh, Pippin, Godspell, Bernstein's Mass, The Magic Show, Baker's Wife, Personals, Captain Louie, Children of Eden, Pocahontas, Hunchback of Notre Dame, Wicked, Enchanted, Snapshots, and Seance on a Wet Afternoon. Stephen Schwartz. And Winnie Holtzman uh, has made, written, you probably know her because she created My So-Called Life on TV. Um, she also worked on, with Stephen on Wicked. She wrote a musical called Birds of Paradise. She wrote episodes of 30-something and a TV show called Huge. And can we talk about what's in development right now? There's a show. A show with Cameron Crowe on Showtime, but it isn't real yet, so we don't want it to. It isn't real yet, but she's developing something. <laughs> yeah. for showtime. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty impressive panel, and I'm, I'm really happy to welcome them here today. I'm also excited because we have, we're covering TV writing, theater writing, lyricists, composers, book writers. We've got all that covered, so there will be room for your questions, but I think the way, the, the topic of the conversation is how we create character in story and song, and I think we can cover a lot of the bases there. Um, the, I just want to start right off the gate, right out of the gate with, uh, what kind of conversations do you have with your collaborators at the very beginning of the process about who tells what, about who, how the character is created? What are those early conversations like? If we're looking at you. Oh, you are? <laughs> I just assumed Stephen would take that one, because he's done it the most of, it, of anybody. And I guess my answer to that would be, from my experience, it's not about who takes what in the beginning, it's about what is this in the beginning. And just a really long conversations, pl conversations plural, about what is, the, what is the story, which becomes, for me, the question that never goes away. It's just like, what is the story? Sometimes that question is slash, what is a story? You know, trying to remember of course, we all really know what stories are because we're fed on them and we have them in our bones and our blood and we really understand them. But when you start to intellectualize and look at something you're writing that you've never written before, you start to blank out. At least this is what happens to me. And you start to go, I don't even know what a story is. <laughs> and so you have to almost, like my friend Bruce Kaplan says, like a stroke victim. <laughs> you have to almost like sort of piece together very slowly, like sort of make your way through this thing that you don't understand. And when you're writing a musical, my experience is you're so lucky because you're doing it with, with, with somebody else or other people. So you have these conversations. Yeah, I mean, when we um, were working on Wicked, when we first started, we spent... I would say at least a year outlining the show before we really wrote anything. Um, really talking through the story, talking through the characters. Um, I did a couple of tiny little musical sketches for myself, but didn't really write any songs, just kind of came up with sounds that might be appropriate for um, the individual characters. Um, Winnie, I know you did a couple of little sketches as well, but we really did spend a year before we wrote. And then when we started, um, I'm finally getting to answer no, the question. Good. Winnie got Glinda right away. She just knew who she was, how she sounded. And I was kind of hazy on her. So I was able to sort of see what Winnie was writing about Glinda and, and, and interpolate that or, or get that or internalize it. On the other hand, I think I got Elphaba right away. And so kind of the early stuff that I was coming up for her, even though actually the first song that I wrote for her, as you'll hear tonight, um, was, was eventually abandoned and, and replaced. Nevertheless, I sort of got her sound and her character, and I think that influenced how you wrote her. The point being that it's collaborative, and, it, and, and sort of the, the person who has the clearest vision first, assuming that the vision feels right to both of you, defines it. 
I want Amanda to answer it too, but before you leave that, before we leave that point, Stephen, when you said in the year that you were outlining, you were coming up with ideas, were they character sketch music, music that reflected character, or music that reflected story? What yeah, was this, is, I, I, this is something I was hoping we would talk about um, in, in more um, detail today, um, which is how you use music to define character, because I think we don't really talk about that very often. That, that we're always talking about the dialogue and the lyrics, but actually music also defines character. And what I was trying to do, um, and I'll talk about where I first became aware of that um, strongly, which had to do with when I worked on the show working and was observing what my co-writers were doing and, and kind of learning from them. Um, but for instance, uh, um, one of the very, very first things that I wrote when I went back and looked at these little sketches I had done was just, I think the witch sounds like this. I think Elphaba sounds like this when she's powerful and it was actually the dom, da dom, dom, bom, that little riff that became the riff into Defying Gravity was there almost from the very beginning. I had no idea where it was gonna go on the show, if it was gonna go on the show, it just felt like her to me. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was it, it was kind of how do these characters sound? What's what is their musical language, etc. And a lot and you know, and I've just cited the the two bars that wound up in the show, but there are a couple of pages of stuff that that never went in that just didn't ultimately feel right. But helped you find your way. It helped me find my way. Yeah. And Amanda, I, I'm just listening to to what these guys were saying. I think Stephen is right. I mean, if you if you've you know, me or the composer has found a musical sketch for a character, that means you have a pretty good beat on the character, you know, because it's, it's a musical, you know, so it is, I mean, uh, lyrically, of course, you know, I'm, you know, if, uh, if I find like a, a phrase that is that person's emblematic phrase or the way they speak or something, then I have a beat on the character. But if there's a musical voice for them, then that's gold, really, because it's, it's a musical. So, you know, I mean, I really, it feels like you've, crystallized the character, and if you b both agree on, you all agree on that vision. But it's, it, you know, Winnie and I were saying when we were kind of preparing for this panel um, five minutes ago, that, um, I did um, and breakfast. talking about the, the well, you're, you know, you're so diligent, um, and we were talking about, again, how you create character, and that uh, um, we realized that the music for Alphaba could not be sung by Glinda. Glinda could, would never sing something, putting aside lyrics, titles, whatever, she would never sing something that was like bom, ba, da, dum, dum. It's not in her character. Similarly, um, Elphaba could never sing something that had the music for popular, regardless what the title was. Now, I didn't find that music until Winnie had written some scenes with Glinda, and then I sort of got, oh, that's who she is. Well, she kind of sounds like this. Um, but I feel that the music itself defines those, those women, and they, they're not interchangeable musically. Well, that leads me to my next question. How nice of you to set that up for me. Um, tell me about what happens when a collaborator creates a piece of the character that is new information to you. Like, you thought you were writing something, and then your collaborator contributes a piece, and you go, oh, Either it's something that comes out in a lyric or a, or a musical gesture or something, and, and then you as the person who had the first pass thinks, oh, I, that's new to me, or now I can run with that. What's well, that like? I mean, excuse me for, you know, I, no other, but, but I can quickly answer something again. You know, I, I, um, talking about Wicked just because Winnie is sitting here with me, I had no idea that, they were, that there, was gonna, there were gonna be Ozisms, that there were gonna be made up words um, that are kind of English but kind of not. Um, and then I read the first scenes that, that Winnie had written, and that's how people were speaking. So <laughs> things that I had already written, um, I went back and inserted, mm -hmm. uh, changed words, et cetera, to, to interpolate that style into the way the um, people in Oz spoke. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've I mean, working with like Doug Wright on Hands on a Hard Body, uh, often scenes that he did informed me about characters and conversations we had would inform a, a lyric, um, you know, like a, in the um, this song I wrote, I'm Gone, we were talking, you know, we knew this, this young woman worked at the UPS and um, 
he said something like, well, just imagine, like, all, every, she's there all night sorting things, and things come to her, and she looks like they're, they're heading to Europe. You know, they have li all these labels on it, and that, like, gave, gave me a huge inspiration. Um, when I was working with Tom Kitt on Bring It On, we had to write a new song for this character. We'd written a song we loved, and it just wasn't, but it wasn't working. And I was like, I love that song. I don't know what to do. That's like as funny as I get. I don't, I don't know what to do. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, it's funny. I don't get it. I, I kept trying to rewrite it. Like, what if I change it this? Or can we save this and use that? And I was just stuck. And then he had like a musical idea. And it was a new character. It was like this whole side of her character. Before it was sort of like she was this evil, scheming, you know, duplicitous, backstabbing little cheerleader. And then he, the music he came, and everything was a variation on that, and then the music he came up with was this bouncy, bubbly, evil little girl, but she was so cute, you know? And um, that made, that like opened it up for me to, to like, you know, I could let go of what I had written and write something funny for this different facet, a, a different mm -hmm. way of looking at the same character. She was still a backstabbing, horrible little girl, but it was a delightful little song about, oh, she was just so happy to be horrible. So yeah, that was, the music really helped. Um, I was just, um, yesterday I was listening to this, uh, you know Alec Baldwin's show, um, Here's the, Here's the yeah. Thing? I was listening to him interview Stephen Daldry, and I was telling this to Stephen, um, our Stephen, the other, just before, and Stephen Daldry was saying this thing I thought was so interesting about writing, even though he was, he was referring to it about, act, about actors, but he was saying, you know, actors come in a lot of times, he experienced and they'll say like, well, my character wouldn't do that, or that's not my character, or something like that, right? And he was saying that I, cor he, this is Stephen Daldry speaking, he says, I correct them and I say, no, wait a minute. Um, we're gonna create the character altogether. You don't know. It isn't your, no, he, what he actually said was, it isn't your character. It's, it, it's, it's something we're going to do together. And that is the nature of writing a musical. Um, you know, there are places where it's much less like that, where you could go off and be a writer and create a character and you'd be all by yourself, I guess. But that isn't what musicals are like. And there is this feeling of like, something's being slowly, you know, sort of fashioned and you are gonna be surprised by by stuff that hit comes in. And then I guess the tricky part, and there's a million of them, tricky parts, but like the tricky part is when something just feels wrong, right? Because you don't wanna say no too quickly, you know what I mean? Because who hasn't had the experience of thinking, oh, that's such a terrible idea. And I mean, we've done this to each other. And, you <laughs> and, you, and then you know, three weeks later you wake up and you go, fuck, that is such a good idea. Um, <laughs> I have to go apologize and I, you know, and I have to rethink, but you know, that, because at first there is this psychological aspect where you do want to feel like it is yours in a way and you, uh, that to me, that's part of, you know, part of understanding how to do all this. I think one of the things that's really exciting and I'm, I'm interested to hear from, from both of you because, you know, Winnie is, is the book writer who sort of, when you get the scene from the book writer and even though, even if it's been really outlined, and you kind of, more than kind of know exactly what's going to be in that scene, but then you actually read it, and you read what the characters are saying, and there are always these amazing surprises, and, and wonderful things, and you think like, oh well, I could just take that and make that the lyric, <laughs> and that moment is so delightful to me, always. Well, that's what it's all about, really. Yeah. I, I would even say that we're all looking for those moments in each other's work, that uh, if, if a book scene comes to me and there's, there's a rhythm in the words or a, a funny a description of something, you're like, well, there's the song, there's the lyric, there's the, I hear the music now. The, even sometimes the rhythm of the, the way the line lands on the page that the, the book writer has created becomes perhaps the title of the song or the beginning of the hook or something because the rhythm of the words tells me, oh, this is gonna be in 6-8 or this is gonna be in 4-4. Like, you just know yeah. where it's coming. Yeah, I, I, the Jeff Whitty is a wonderful book writer. I worked with him on Bring It On. He wrote, we, you know, we, we had a draft of the show and, and then we we're like, maybe we need a song at the end. And I read his last scene and I was like, it's right here. I mean, this is it, you know? I mean, it was, it was uh, he really just had it, you know, it was beautiful. Yeah. And I mean, all three of us knew Arthur Lawrence uh, pretty well. 
um, he was a teacher for, for me. He taught me, and he would teach us that. He would, he would say that was the, actually the job. That's how he defined his job as a book writer. Part of his job was to, you know, his image was sort of like you're almost furnishing logs into a fire. You're sort of, you know, and that's why I tend with a book Obviously, musical books are, tend to be eloquent and, and, and short and, and elegant and spare because music expands in time and songs take up a lot of the time of a musical. So you don't have the, the ability to maybe have an incredibly discursive scene. But I tend to write and write and write because I'm not thinking this scene's going to end up that way. I'm sort of furnishing material in a funny way. And that's something I was taught by Arthur. Um, and what happens if you're furnishing that material and two thirds of it winds up not being in the show? Is it that how is that how it is? I mean, th that's what I'm saying. Is that um, that's what that's now? I sound kind of old, <laughs> mm -hmm. but that's how I've come to expect. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how else to put that. That that I think is part of part of it. Um, Maybe you're saying if there's like a very special part that you loved. No, I'm, I'm encouraging you to say exactly what you said. <laughs> I, think that's, I think it is part of the But job. look, we've, we've had the experience, I'm sure you have too, where you know a, a book writer has said, um, I get that you're taking all of this and you want to change that, but I really just love this one line and 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 I would love and you're like okay well we'll just then it'll we'll find a way that that line is there you know right. I mean that's again that's that's, that's part the of the collaboration, collaboration. right yeah. yeah well I've even had things I mean speaking of wicked obviously you know to, easier for me to talk about since I've done precious little else mm -hmm. <laughs> and also because he's sitting right here but um there's this wor there's this well, part of the way I tend to work sometimes is uh, I, I do fixate on certain words, and certain words are going to be important to certain characters, and they're going to almost become emblematic to that character. And uh, we had a couple of those in Wicked, certainly lyrically and book-wise. Certainly the, the word good and the word wicked is very, very important in our world. But um, the word beautiful, I had big plans for that word. <laughs> I, I had very specific plans of when that word was going to appear in terms of Elphaba and her relationship to being beautiful, or whether or not she could be beautiful. And I, I think there was maybe a time when I would say to you, well, I don't want to use the word beautiful here. Right, yeah. Because be I'm, I'm saving it for that, absolutely. Yes, and you're exactly. like, okay, it's gone. Yeah. Exactly. Because that's the kind of specificity of word choice, which we will get into talking about that, you know, obviously you're, it's just a matter of making constant choices, right? Uh, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean so, the word, that is horrible, the, horrible choices. <laughs> but, but no, that was, I mean, you, again, you sort of segued into that. I sort of had two things that I wanted to talk Go. about, and that's one of them, um, that because the title of this is, is something about creating character through story and so on. But it's about creating character. So I was thinking about that and your word choice and particularly your choice of nouns is very, very important. I love um, everyone's writing that down. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, and you should write it down. Because yes. um, it's something I learned from um, observation of people whose work I admired and also... Um, you know, heard, and so I was thinking of, I was trying to think of an example, and we were talking about it, and you know, and we were talking about the, the song One Short Day in Wicked, which is really just there because our producer, after I'd written the first two songs that were kind of grim, you know, said like, well, I mean, is there ever, I mean, the songs, they're good, but, and I will said, you want to know if anything will ever be fun in the show, right? <laughs> he said, well, yes. So I said, all right, I'll write this sort of song where they go to, uh, so the, the point being that it's not an incredibly character-driven song, um, and was never meant to be, and yet, there is a um, little section of the song where the our two girls ex are experiencing being in the Emerald City, and what became very significant, and it was very helpful for me, because Winnie had written, of course, endless monologues about what they were seeing and what they were experiencing. Like, what do they notice? And there is a lyric where 
um, they say, uh, you know, what, what Glinda is noticing is dress, uh, because Glinda says dress salons and Elphaba says libraries, and Glinda says palaces and Elphaba says museums. And those are five words. And you know everything about those two girls. Not everything, but you know a lot about those two girls based on what, what it is that is impressing them in their visit to the Emerald City. So the point being that you create character by, by your word choices for, for the characters, even in a song that's not necessarily a character number, they, I mean, Elphaba would never notice that there were dress salons there. <laughs> Right. And right. Glinda would be like, if she walked by a library, she'd be like, what is this place? <laughs> they would not, b but, but you know who they are because of those things. And, and I mean, I know it's obvious to say, but particularly when you're writing lyrics and we're all worrying about like, oh God, it has to fit this rhythm and the right has to rhyme and it's, you know, there's all this stuff that's, so it's, it's kind of easy to, to let yourself off that hook of being very, very careful about making sure that this character is singing words that that he or she that that's within the world of that character. Um, so that was one of the things that I, I want to make sure we said. That's great. Yeah. Can I jump into something? Yep. I just wanted to add that just speaking of collaboration and finding your story, finding finding your tone in a number. When he said I had written a lot, I had I had written a lot of stuff that is certainly not in the show, of them, because <laughs> we, we talked about, we talked endlessly about, well, yeah, they're going to the Emerald City together, but we didn't really feel the tone. Like, what was the tone of it? And we stumbled, I forget how, but through these endless conversations into this idea that it was like, if you only have one day in the Emerald City, like it was like a, like it was like they're, they're I remember you said it's like two girls in Paris. And the feeling was we were going to get to the idea that they were together somewhere and it was forging their friendship. But I really hooked into this tourist idea. So I wrote a lot, a lot of dialogue about they were looking through. Um, they had a book, If You Only Have One Day in the Emerald City, and they were looking through tourist attractions. And I was you know, making jokes and stuff. But the point is it fed that feeling of the tone that we were looking yeah. for. So even though none of that stuff is in the show, there's the ghost of that is in the show. Do, do you know led, what I mean? That led to One Short Day, the title of the song. It led exactly ultimately right. to... Exactly, yeah. exactly. And you could also say that there's something about the character of the place, you know, that what you were saying about um, needing a fun moment there, that you were also creating a different place, a different location. The Emerald City is different from where we've been, and so the sound of this place is different in the way that your two women yeah, musically, are different. Musically, it's definitely different. Yes. Yeah. Amanda? <laughs> I, I, what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> when you were writing Wicked. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, when I was writing it, I saw it differently. Yeah. I don't know that there was specifically a Now question. there's no question, it's just a kind of crazy No, but I do think that language, of course, language is, is oh, vitally, vitally important. Let me important. ask it and then you can answer. Oh. Um, oh, talk to me about language. <laughs> <laughs> well, Georgia, language is vitally, vitally important. No, <laughs> no it's true. I mean, it, dep it, it defines your world and, um, uh, you know, hands on a hard body are, are people in, you know, East Texas who, who all need the money to to win that truck to make their lives possible, you know, not to uh, not as a lark. Uh, so it, you have to write for those people in that world. And it was fun. I mean, limitations of language can be really fun because they, they, they force you to, you know, I, I could still have fun with rhymes, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be using, you know, $10 words. Um, and, and I also wouldn't be, you know, they don't have to say ain't and shucks and yee-haw either because, you know, so you, I mean, you, it's important to write for a full rounded character uh, for me because I, you know, I come, I'm from New York so I would have assumptions about people from East Texas, you know, and that wasn't the case. Um, but the, the limitations of the language and, 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 and wicked of, you know, the, the language you guys made up, um, those things are limitations and they sort of set you free, you know, are, are the fun of it, the fun of writing a show. Yeah, it's really fun to write for characters who don't have the best grammar in the world. Yes. Who don't have the Act. best vocabulary in the world. Yeah. Um, who misuse words. Who, um, it's, it's also, you, you reminded me when you said that, like, 
rhyme, the amount of rhyme tells you things about the character. Mm -hmm. Rhyme yes. tends to um, uh, uh, indicate intelligence and, and verbal acuity, particularly inner rhyming, etc. So it, it, if you have that kind of character, that can be your friend. But if you're trying to present a very sort of plain spoken character, then it's then it's not your friend. Then then you're actually working against yourself and creating. I think Stephen Stephen Sondheim has a very famous story about I feel pretty from yes. West Side Story. Right. Yes. Um, and the story is that he he was young. It was one of his first shows, and he wrote I feel pretty. I feel pretty. I feel witty. I feel pretty and witty and bright. And I pity any girl who isn't me tonight. And and later in years later, looking back on that, he said she's an immigrant. English is not her first language, and she works in a dress shop. She would not be that yeah. smart. Those are not the words. She would not be full of the, inner The rhyme. one he's always citing as, as being particularly embarrassing to him is, it's alarming how charming, charming I, I feel. feel. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but so it still I, worked. Yeah. But, 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 yeah, <laughs> clever <laughs> rhyming didn't is hurt for, the show uh, that much. <laughs> <laughs> but clever rhyming is for clever characters, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it's important to make sure that your characters don't all sound like you. They don't all speak the way that you speak. And sometimes that's, especially when, um, when, when seeing a new piece or reading something by a new person, if, if you think, I, I hear the voice of the writer more than the voice of the character, that's a problem. And that is uh, exactly what you guys are talking about with the specificity of the character. Yeah, and, and you can go, you know, you don't have to get it right the first time, too. You can sort of write the, if you if you're doing a song for a character and you can you can work out well what is this actually about and what does the character want and what's the title and where am I going with it and and you can work that out and then say okay I have that in terms of the storytelling but as George just said but the, it just sounds like me so now how what do I do what words do I change what choices do I make so it really sounds like that person yeah. That's really great. That's empowering to think it doesn't have to be your first pass. It can oh, be part God, of your no. editing yeah. work. Well, that's right. like a key to life in a way. Because, <laughs> I mean, I think there's such a... I still struggle with this really on a daily basis where there's a part of your mind that sort of acts like or thinks that you're supposed to come out with something that lo you know that looks like a 10th or 15th draft. Do you know what I mean? That you're suppo it's supposed to come out elegant and beautiful and the characters are all different from each other and that's not real life. That's not what writing is really like. Um, but still there's this fantasy in your head and I th I'm, I'm just speaking for myself but maybe one or two people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so it's like just to it helps me to just literally say to myself this is the draft for this. In other words, this is the draft where I'm figuring out the story. And in a funny way, even though character and story are certainly inextricably related and part of each other, if you really don't know what happens next, you have to figure that out. And you, you know, maybe your characters will be wooden for a while. And that's kind of okay. You just go back later and you go, now I need to deepen this character. I need to make them more human. Um, I mean, I think. It's hard to say that, though, because, of course, what people do in a story is, is their character. I mean, it's, it's, mm. it's the same. That's Chekhov, right? Action is character. Yeah, yeah. or yeah. I don't know who said it. Somebody I said it. I think Gypsy Rosalie or... <laughs> Marcia Norman. Chekhov or Gypsy Rosalie. <laughs> we, we had, like, conversations with hands on a hard body talking about character. Like, uh, you know, there's a guy who's an Iraqi vet and, like, for a while we're like, maybe he comes back and kills, you know, waving a gun because that happened in real life. But we, you know, so you make you make decisions if that is a very different character than a boy who breaks down crying because he has post-traumatic stress disorder and he's, and he's comforted by an older man and it's different from someone who comes back waving a gun. So, you know, um, you make decisions like that. We decided he was not a guy who came back with a gun. You know, um, another character, as we were writing it, it was helpful for us to him, for him to have prejudices because he would really rub against characters and stuff and, and things that were little jokes became bigger things and that became a dramatic turning point. You know, so you, do, you develop characters too as you go along. Can I do my other agenda item or do you I'm have your agenda? I think I'm leading Okay, you're leading to it. Go ahead. So we were ju I just said talk to me about language. What about musical language? Ah, thank you, Georgia. <laughs> Why, now that you bring it up, it occurs to me. Um, yeah, this is something that we don't really talk about very much. Um, which is that music itself creates character. Um, and 
uh, frankly, for the first, I don't know, 10 years of when I was professionally writing or thereabouts, I actually didn't think about that very much. I, you know, I was concerned in, in terms of songs, in, in terms of storytelling, in terms of the emotional truth of what was happening, um, but I didn't really think that much about characterizing through music. And then when I was doing the show Working, um, Craig Cornelia wrote a song about a retired man called Joe. And the music for that song tells you all about the character. The guy is, and it's, and it's all subtext. The guy is talking about how happy he is now that he is retired and how full his day is. And, and he's just describing all the things he does in his day. And the music is just going, mm, dun, dun, bum, bum, dun, dun, bum, bum, over and over again in this kind of bleak and um, mournful way. And I and and I was I, when I heard that I thought oh the music should be telling you things about the character too I realized that you could hear that and not speak English not actually know what the words were but you know who that character is because of the music and then there were other things in that show like um, James Taylor wrote the song for um, the character of the mill worker and it sounds kind of Irish and folk, and you just, you know everything about that woman's background and her heritage and everything. It's all in the music. And because I was working with multiple composers and they were um, taking characters to whom they had um, emotional affinity in some way and therefore their music was conveying that, that was very influential on me. So when it came time to write the song for the waitress, and one of the things that she says in her in in her um, interview, which which became part of the show, is she said, "You know, when I get heated, I don't I don't give a damn. I speak like an Italian speaks." And so I thought, "Well, okay, how does an Italian speak?" And so the music became basically La Traviata. It's basically like a, a takeoff on, on um, Semper Libra, Libra and La Traviata. But the point being that if you hear the music to the waitress song, which has nothing to really to do with about being a waitress or even that much to do with emotionally what she's going through, but it gives you sort of her character, her, her ethnicity, and, and, um, and these were all things I didn't used to think about, but then since that time I'm very conscious of, which is why by the time, you know, uh, got to writing Wicked, I really was thinking like, well, well, you know, putting aside the words, what does Elphaba sound like musically? What does Glinda sound like musically? And I just think a lot of times we forget to consider that, but it's very helpful. Spo especially with characters of different generations, they don't all sound alike. And, you know, if someone's from Europe and someone's, you know, five, mm -hmm. you know, it, they do not all live in the same musical world. And that's what makes it exciting. Yes. Too. Yeah. So that with microphone. <laughs> um, oh, perfect. I lost my train of thought when that happened. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I'm going to go to the next question and maybe I'll come back to it. Uh, does the commercial viability of a project change the way you write the character? If you're I don't writing, even know what that means, though. Okay, if you're writing um, for a big Broadway show, if you're writing for a big company, Disney, oh, or I see something, what you or mean. if you're writing an off-Broadway piece or a smaller piece, or if you're writing an animated film, or if you're writing, d depend, does that change the way you write for characters? Does that change the kinds of characters you well, write and the way doing, you write for them? You know, if you're writing for Disney, a Disney animated feature, they probably shouldn't say fuck. <laughs> well, for starters. <laughs> oh, fuck. Write that down. But other than that, <laughs> not so much, I think. Not really. Well, I mean, to me, honestly, it's, I, I identify with what Linda Bloodworth Thomason was saying. I mean, to me, I think she was kind of alluding to what Larry Gelbart had imparted to her, which is that you know, I think it's kind of a detail where it ends up. I mean, I think it has to do with, you know, the big, the big thing for me is I, f I identify as somebody, <laughs> sounds like a gender question, but I, I identify as somebody who writes something that actors are going to do. That's how I think about it. I don't write a novel. I mean, well, so there, I'm not identifying with her. But I mean, I'm going to do something where hopefully a bunch of people are going to come in and help me have it happen. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna play the parts. 
So what I'm really thinking about is actors. I, was a, I saw a panel yesterday where Lisa Crone said that making a play is really making a blueprint. And I was struck by that, that sometimes as a writer, I think I'm, I'm creating a thing and then I have created it. But she was like, that's not the thing. The thing is actually the evening that you spend in the theater, the way the actors bring it, the way the set looks, the way the costumes Correct. look, the evening. You're and yet, the evening. You, and yet, if you aren't writing something with the specificity the sort of emotional specificity that could inspire people, nobody will come. And I don't mean the audience. I mean no, no really good actors will show up and no really good designers. In other words, you have to be, you have to furnish something that is attracting those creative people into your world. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think about. I don't think about commercial viability. I, I mean, to me, that's not a phrase I would ever want to even think about because I feel like that would just destroy my, my life, actually. <laughs> um, but I mean, I really, I, re I don't even know what that means. And I don't think it's possible to know what that means because, you know, you never know. But, but I do think it, what you, it is possible to think, is this a part, for instance, that a person would be excited to play? I mean, I've said this a million times, so forgive me, but, you know, this one introduced me to Kristen Chenoweth. The second I met Kristen Chenoweth, I was like, it's got to be her. Well, how do I make that happen? She wasn't as famous then, but she was getting quite famous, and it wasn't the, the lead. The lead was Elphaba. How do, how do you make that happen? Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden I knew, well, that part's got to be better. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how that, no, literally, and that's how that happened. I mean, so. There's all kinds of ways that you get inspired about what the part's going to be. I'm now going to go rewrite everything I've ever written. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remembered what I was going to say a minute ago, Stephen, and we were talking about using character in music. And uh, I wanted to talk about when you, this is maybe not as much for Stephen, but for the, the other two, what happens when your collaborator is not primarily a theater writer? When you have to write with someone who comes from the world of pop music or the world of classical music or something else, and, and, and there's more of a responsibility on you to, to be the bearer of character. How, how do you negotiate that? Or have you had to negotiate that? Uh, yeah, well, I worked with uh, Trey Anastasio. Ah, oh, yeah, from Fish. Uh, and uh, he, <laughs> he, joined, he joined me as a co-composer on Hands on a Hard Body. And uh, it was a, a learning process, but he surprised me as well because he's, he's, he's from a rock band and he entertains people. So his job is to keep the crowd happy and entertain. And uh, so, like, I had a lyric for this character and I loved the lyric and I was like, here you go, you're welcome. You know, and he was like, why, you know, and he was like, he was like, why is the guy talking about the truck? I'm so bored about the truck. I mean, who's he sleeping with? What's he doing? What's he doing? And I was like, I was like, you're right. Boy, yeah, this is, a, this is adult. This is a, the 80th song about a truck. You know, so um, I went back because of him, and then he had like, oh, it's like Dr. John and blah, blah, blah. You know, then we created this really fun song together. And then there were instances where he was like, this is a really cool lick. And I was like, well, what are the actors doing while this lick is playing? You know, are they just looking at each other, waiting for their <laughs> next line? Like, we can't, there's no room for that. You know, they got it. We got to just keep it going. And there can't be instrumentals in between unless they're, it's, it's, it's specific to an action or something. Not that there can't be, but it was, you know, it was stopping. The, the drama of a song, but he caught on pretty But quickly. a director will have to say, here's what's happening while that lick is playing. Here's what your actors are yeah, doing. Yeah, if there's a reason for it, then, you know, yeah, I mean, it's not an absolute there can't be a lick, but it was sort of stopping, you know, the, song, the actor would be there like five, six, seven, eight, <laughs> two, two, three, four, you know, like, <laughs> so, <laughs> but he caught on pretty quickly. But you do, and, and it was a learning curve for him, and, and he was certainly surprised about how long it took, and, and, um, uh, the, everything that goes into it, but he was also delighted too. You know, when the first time he heard actors singing his stuff back at him, he just blew him away. Yeah. Wow. Oh, you look like you have something. To oh, say. I just was going to say. I mean, I've been guilty of this as much as, as uh, probably more than anyone, but not more than anyone. But I mean, you can't really leave it to the director. I mean, yeah. you have the di director at some point will tell you things that he or she wants to have happen. But in other words, if you, you have to be furnishing that for yourself first, even though the director might come in and want to change things. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you do have to know like what's going on when between, between the verses or what in that piece, in that interval. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I, yeah. Like that, 
would be, I think, critical. Or at least look at it this way, to put a more positive spin on it and, and sound less like a school marm and annoying person. Like, it's, it's an interesting question. Like, you know, in other words, you don't want to skip that question. What's happening, what's happening on stage while, while the, before the second verse starts? You know what I mean? In that interval. Um, because if you, you, you want to just pose it for yourself, I think, and try to see if you, if that will inform for ha perhaps, I mean, what is, when I say what's happening, obviously it's all gonna further the story. I mean, it's all, it's all about helping, and I love that you use the word entertaining because we do tend to lose sight of this because we've just right. got a million, we've got a million things in our mind and life is really hard, but it's gotta, be, you know, we have to think about it isn't just, we're not presenting a, you know, a thesis. A thesis. <laughs> we're entertaining and it's all about seduction and entertaining and having people have a good time. Um, so I'm using the word seduction in a very specific, uh, very open-ended way. Now I sound filthy. But it's just like, <laughs> I mean, it's not about sexual seduction necessarily, although that might be your story, but it's about some kind of way in which you're pulling a group of people along with you and getting them very interested. And that, that it involves really thinking about psychologically what people are longing for to have, you know, I always do, I mean, there's such a thing called obligatory beats. You know what I mean? Like, if you're telling a story about blank, what would be, if you were gonna walk into the theater and you were gonna see a story about a green witch and that's all you knew, and you knew that she lived, you know, that it was this witch that you'd seen in a movie when you were young and now she was gonna have her own musical. What are some of the things you would really be disappointed by if they, did, they didn't show up on stage? Do you know what I mean? Like, if, if, it, if there were no munchkins in the story, would you go, why were there no munchkins? Or would you just go, yeah, that's cool, no munchkins. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you do wanna ask yourself, like, what's the obligatory thing that, I'm, that people are waiting to have happen? Um, I think, so. Well, you know, I, I, speaking of obligatory beats, so there was this song in Wicked, um, which was when the two girls are forced together as roommates. And I wrote four different, four or five complete songs for that spot, and none of them worked. And it was so frustrating, and finally I went to by that point, we had a director, and you know, I said to Joe Montello, I "I'm having so much trouble with this. I mean, maybe they don't need to sing a song here <laughs> at all. I mean, do we have to do that? Is this like obligatory?" And he was like, "Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it is an obligatory beat. They're forced together. We, they're in the room together. We have to see that." And then fortunately, Winnie had the idea of doing a falling in hate song, or a hate at first sight song, um, and, and that solved it for me. Um, and then again, because again, it, it, I, could, I could approach it from the point of view of these two characters and what do they specifically hate about each other. Um, and, and the mistake I had been making, or the thing that had been a dead end, was this sort of general song they were singing about um, I hate being with you, but it but it wasn't it wasn't specific enough to the characters, and that's what what solved it. Um, you know, but the point being, like, it was just an obligatory beat, and and we had to do it, and I just had to keep trying until finally it it got solved. We're almost at time, and so I have one last question, and this is just the the uh, as you exit fun question. Um, <laughs> no audience, no audience questions. Well, uh, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we can we, let me ask this one, and then ask we'll and then we'll question. open up with whatever's left. Uh, tell me about a favorite character you've created and a proud contribution of yours to that character's story. Just a moment, something that you were like, I did that. I mean, everything you created Alphaba, but everything. <laughs> like a, a favorite moment. Other people first. Okay. Well, I can. I, I, my favorite character that I've ever written was is Frollo from Hunchback of Notre Dame. 
I just love being Frollo. And I understand why people like to play villains. He, it is so much fun to be this guy who takes no responsibility for any of the terrible things he does and projects them onto other people and blames them all. Um, and that was just, it's like being a Republican. It's so much fun. So much fun to go there. You shouldn't go there in real life. But it's really fun to write that. So I was very, I'm very proud of, of being able to make that, uh, that character and, um, you know, and, and come up with that, you know, the, that whole Hellfire song for him is the most fun I've ever had writing. I just loved being him. Awesome. So that's okay. my answer. Amanda? <laughs> uh, I was thinking, I mean, it's, I, I love writing comedy, but the thing, like one day, this song um, in uh, Hands on a Heart Body called uh, Stronger, uh, which is written by a, a uh, which is sung by a, a vet, uh, like I, it was just one of those days, like I, I was out at, and like the song came to me and he, this guy came to me. I had a vision of this guy, like young guy marine with a guitar I don't know and I just was like I, I had to stop like I don't you know it don't, I had to like stop and sit on stoops and write and write and write and write and and um and I and it just sort of came like it was one of those like boom you know it happens to you and um and then um like a week later it was around the time of the Iraq war so it's not like I, I didn't it was in in the zeitgeist it was in the air all this a, a week later I saw a picture of that guy in the Times and this story of this boy and there was a guy and a boy and there was video of him playing guitar. Mm -hmm. and, and it was like literally like lyrics I'd written. He was like, yeah, I was cutting up and, and thing. And my first line was like, I was cutting up and acting like a fool. And I was like, oh my God. You know, so that was like a, a chills uh, moment. Chills. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What about you, George? Huh? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I wasn't prepared to answer. Um, I, I'm going to make Winnie go. <laughs> I don't know. You know, and I have an answer, but. which is that this is really my favorite favorite. Of, I don't have a favorite, but to me, um, we've been unofficially talking about our movie, and I did get um, our Wicked movie, but it's unofficial. But I got an idea for something with um, Galinda that is, a, that is something that pleased me so much because cause it made me go, you know, I don't know, I still don't know everything about her. And I, I, I figured out something else about her that pleased me so much and made, and I found so interesting that I thought shed light on her in an interesting way. And I thought it was cool that you I could. You can say what it is. Really? Yeah. No, I don't want to. Really? <laughs> can I say? <laughs> Yeah. Well, Winnie had this revelation because in the show, Glinda is um, upper class and she's from the upper uplands. And then Winnie had this revelation that, in fact, she's from sort of middle class or like lower a humble, middle class. a humble and little. And that she, but she has these aspirations, oh. and it actually pays off for the character in all the choices she makes. Oh. And this was an example of Winnie told me this, and I was like, "That's a terrible idea. What are you talking about? We can't do that. No." And then about two days later, I called her and I said, I've been thinking about it, and it's just the best idea. You have to do that. But my initial response was absolutely to shut it down. Um, it is, it's 2.50. We have to wrap up. Um, do you want to, I'll take one question or two questions. Oh, there are so many. Um, back here. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think this is being taken, uh, addressed in another session, but I wondered, is there no standard etiquette for the relationship between the director, the playwright, and the actresses or actors um, in terms of, like you had said, you come up with an idea, but if the director doesn't like it, he, he or she would defer to the playwright necessarily, or if the actress, um, like... Directors don't know the word defer. <laughs> <laughs> you have to bring them in the dictionary. Yeah. Um, I, no, the only thing is that I do really ascribe to the rule that as the, uh, I, I will never talk to the actors, except to say like, ah, oh, you're doing great, but I will never, ever give a note to an actor. That is sort of protocol in the theater, that all, in, everything has to be funneled through one source and, and it's, it, it's a director, so that is protocol. But um, if you and the director are having disagreements, you have to work it out. You know, don't fight in front of the children. 
You have to work it out privately. Right, but who might win in terms of, I mean, there's no etiquette. It's depending upon your relationship with the director. If you're the playwright, let's just put it between those two. And the playwright has another idea, but the director's going, no, 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 it's fine the way it is. I don't like that. Yeah, Will it happens the director defer all the time. The playwright? It's not going to be that simple. It really yeah. depends on everything. It depends on everything. And I think the best way I can describe it is, it's sort of what Stephen was saying. The, 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 the play or musical is the baby. And everyone wants to, hopefully in a good situation, no matter how much people are disagreeing, everybody wants that baby to grow up and do well. Sure. Okay? So it's like you, whatever's best for the baby in the end not because I had the idea or you had it or whatever. It's like, what really is best for the baby? And that's what makes it come together. I mean, that's the best I can answer. Yeah. It's really, there. I mean, it's very, it's very case specific, I think. You know, not even just relationship specific. Um, you know, it, yeah. it's, it's really on a case by case basis. And sometimes you, I mean, I do think, let's, let's be honest, I mean, there's some arguments that are not going to be solved and then you kind of have to pick your battles. I mean, there were things that um, we disagreed with Joe Mantello about, um, who directed Wicked, and, and in the end it was like, you know what, that's not so important and let's do that. And then there were a couple of things where we said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. We are the writers. This is how it has to be. And, and he finally, you know, and because many times we had said, you know what, I don't agree with you, but you're the one who has to get the actors to do it anyway, so absolutely do, do that. But so when we would actually go, say like, no, 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 we're going to the mat on this one, he always said, okay. So I guess, you know, it's, it's picking your battles. Thank you. And we have to wrap up. Thank you all. Thank all right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, just just the things to to remember. That was